morning. We're looking at the book of Luke, and we're finishing the first chapter. For the Jewish people, God had seemed silent. Israel turned away from God. God told them that they would be taken away and in captivity. They were taken to Babylon, approximately 600 BC. The last time God spoke through his prophet, Malachi, was 400 years before Christ. People had very little understanding that God was there and had a plan. They had been oppressed by different leaders for the last 400 years. And at present, they were under the thumb of Rome. People talked about religion, but they didn't talk about knowing God. Why should they be concerned about God? He doesn't seem to be concerned about us. Humans are very pragmatic and practical. They want to know what God can do for them. What can you do for me? What have you done for me lately? They have been oppressed in poverty, enslaved by Rome and Greek, Greece and the other uh, nations that ruled them since Babylon came and took them as captives under Nebuchadnezzar II. We feel the same way. What have you done lately for me, God? But in this passage, we see that God did something through Jesus. We see that what drives Jesus as a person, what his mission is, it's not about him. It's about accomplishing a mission. He did what he was called to do, and it resulted in a magnetism and popularity that was unbelievable. Sociologically speaking, popularity is how much a person, idea, or place, or item, or concept is liked or accorded status by other people. On today's parlance, we would say an influencer. In past generations, it's been celebrities who have been influencers, not so much anymore. But see, Jesus wasn't chasing popularity. He was not seeking to have influence. Jesus was on a mission. He was communicating a new message with power. The kingdom of God has arrived. Mark chapter 1 29 through 45. Jesus' ministry has really taken off. 
people are talking about it. The crowds are growing. He is overwhelmed by people. And Jesus needs time alone. He desires his mission to be accomplished more than the accolades of the people. But when Jesus touches our life, we can't be quiet. First chapter of Mark, verses 29 through 45. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with G James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because he knew because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to a priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as the testimony, as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. See, Jesus was facing this extreme popularity of the crowds. They were going crazy. But at the same time, the opposition from the leaders of Judaism was growing as well. He went to the home of Simon and Andrew. Their home was, there was large enough for an extended family and for, for Jesus to stay there. Archaeologists in 1968 excavated a first century house under the remains of a sixth century octagonal church just a few hundred feet from the synagogue in Capernaum. 
In this home, there were Christian markings that it was used for a house church. And there are a lot of people who believe this was Peter's home. See, Peter was raised in Bethsaida, but Simon and Andrew moved to Capernaum as a base of their operations for their fishing business. As we talked last week, the fishing industry was a big time industry in the first century. Fish was taken to Alexandria, Antioch, Rome, everywhere. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed. This is Simon Peter, who was the lead disciple, the first one that was called. And he was married, and we, we know that from 1 Corinthians 9, 5, but here his mother-in-law is bedridden. She has a high fever. Deuteronomy 28.22 says, The Lord will strike you with fever and inflammation. So this was perceived as a fever, something that came from God. Fever was not necessarily understood as a symptom of something else like we understand it today, but it was a disease rather itself. Before the 20th century, infectious diseases killed a lot of people. The average life expectancy was 47, 48. Infectious diseases such as smallpox, cholera, diphtheria, pneumonia, typhoid, the plague, tuberculosis, typhus, syphilis, were rampant. It wasn't until 1928 when Sir Alexander Fleming began to work in creating antibiotics. It wasn't until 1945 that antibiotics became a common thing. They marked the beginning of the antibiotic era that which most of us have grown up in. When someone gets a fever, you take an aspirin, you take an antibiotic, and you're fine but not in the first century. We know now that fever is caused by viruses, bacteria, chronic illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis can cause fever. There are certain tropical diseases it's like malaria and typhoid, heat stroke. Some drugs have a side effect of fever. Fever doesn't just go away. You can put a cool washcloth, but there was no ice in the first century. In a place like Capernaum, if there was any ice anywhere, it had to be hauled in for miles. It was too precious to be used on someone for fever. But Jesus touches her, lifts her up, and instantly her fever is gone. This was a miracle. And all the sick and demon-possessed started coming to the house. It says Mark uses a double wording, when evening came after sunset, he's very explicit. 
This is something we see in the, in the Gospel of Mark and the Greek. See, the Jewish day began at sunset. So Sabbath is now over, and people can bring their sick to Jesus without violating the Sabbath command. And he would not let the demons speak. He, bind, he bound them by shutting their mouths and casting them out of people to keep his messianic nature from being talked about. He went off into a solitary place where he prayed. See, there's a real contrast between Jesus, who wants to be alone with God, and his disciples. Peter is asleep. Jesus gets up and leaves the home and goes to a solitary place in order to feel restored and have fellowship with his father. He time, spends this intimate time with his father. And Peter's words are almost a rebuke. Everyone's looking for you. In other words, what are you doing here, Jesus? This is not where you should be. You need to be with the crowds. We're building a following. This thing is just starting to take off. Things are not happening now. You don't have time to be alone and to pray. But that's not Jesus. And that's not a true disciple. Martin Luther, the converted monk from Catholicism, once he started reading Romans and the Greek and understood what it was saying, he became converted and changed. And Martin Luther is credited to saying, I have so much to do that if I don't spend at least three hours a day in prayer, I would never get it all done. See, his priorities had changed. Everyone is looking for you. And he wasn't pleased about this. His response was, let's go to an, the next town. I'll preach there also. This is why I came. Let us go somewhere else. I am called to preach. Not to bask in adulation of the crowds. So he went to the other cities in Galilee. And as he was going, a man with leprosy came. Leprosy is in the Bible, and it's first mentioned in Leviticus 13 through 14. And it's... a very deadly health threat to people. A leper was to stay at least 50 paces from others. So when he came, this one leper came to Jesus so close that Jesus could touch him, it was unthinkable. He was indignant at the situation. See, this word leprosy has to do with skin diseases, a whole bunch of them, not just Hansen's disease, which most people think of today, and that's what we call leprosy. A person who had this disease was mocked and shamed. A leper had to wear torn clothes 
leave his hair unkempt, cover his face, and cry out unclean. He was forced to live in isolation. Josephus, the historian, said a leper was in no way different from a corpse. If you were a leper, you were already dead. That's how they treated you. Hansen's bacillus, the cause of modern leprosy, it was a, is a devastating and a dreadful effect on the human body. Dr. Paul Brand dedicated much of his life to studying the disease and caring for lepers. He eventually wrote a book that was semi-autobiographical entitled Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants. See, the problem with leprosy is it makes you numb. You don't feel pain. And when you don't feel pain, it's very dangerous because you can hurt yourself very easily. He grew up with his father, who was a medical missionary in uh, the southern hills of India. He uh, writes, over time, Childhood memories of medicine had distilled into a few scenes of suffering, and now I found these scenes abhorrent. There was the revolting scene of my parents working on a woman tormented by guinea worms, including one whose dragon tail poked out of the corner of her eye. This worm that she had in her the tail of the worm was poked out of her eye. And the memory of my father's most challenging patient was a man who survived the mauling by a bear. His scalp was torn off from ear to ear. But the most haunting of them all, he says, my father would not even let us watch him work on the three strange men who approached the clinic one afternoon. He confined us to the house, but I sneaked out and peered through the bushes. These men had stiff hands, covered with sores. Fingers were missing. Bandages covered their feet. And when Dad removed those bandages, I saw that their stumpy feet had no toes. I watched my father mystified. Could he actually be afraid? He did not banter with these patients, and he did something I had never seen him do before. He put on a pair of gloves before dressing their wounds. The men had brought a basket full of fruit as a gift, but after they left, mother burned the basket along with my father's gloves and an unheard of act of waste. We were ordered not to play in that spot. Those men were lepers, we are told. See, Jesus was indignant because it's, it's such a horrible thing. Jesus didn't like being away from people. There was a strong warning And he tells them, don't tell anybody what happened. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But when you, these, this man has experienced the hand of God and had been healed, um, someone just can't be silent. When Christ has changed you or me, we must go public with the incredible joy that we feel. Jesus wanted to delay 
the talk about this miracle. He said, go show yourself to a priest. See, they were in Capernaum. To go to a priest, you had to go to Jerusalem. Leprosy was one of the, the illnesses that could be healed, but leprosy also had not to be only healed, but it had to be cleansed. It re demanded a ritual cleansing by the priest. And it was a complex ritual, an eight day ceremony. It involved offerings presented in the temple. And this trip would take him to Jerusalem. He wanted him to go there and to allow the people to know that there's someone had been healed and cleansed from leprosy. Jesus became so popular, so talked about, that he stayed in lonely places. See, Jesus needed time alone with his father. Children are always asking their parents for stuff. And unfortunately, too many Christians are only thing they ever do to talk to God is they have their shopping list, their prayer list. Jesus centered on his kingdom mission his preaching. He did not seek popularity with the crowds. He was there, there to preach the word of God. And a pastor of a church needs to preach the word of God. John Stott said, Christianity is, in its very essence, a religion of the word of God. Luther would add, let us consider it certain and conclusively established that the soul can do without all things except the word of God, and that where this is not there, it is no help for the soul in anything else, whatever. In other words, er, the word of God is everything. When our life has been touched by Jesus, we must tell others about it. Has your life been changed by Christ? Do you talk about it? That is your testimony. Probably the key verse for the book of Mark is found in chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And he gave his life a ransom for many. There is a song who speaks, which speaks of this sharing of our life shackled by a heavy burden neath a load of guilt and shame then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same since I met this blessed Savior since he cleansed and made me whole I will never cease to praise him I'll shout it out while eternity rolls he touched me Oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. This is what Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote, the song, He Touched Me, written in 1963. It could have been or probably was inspired by this text. 
he touched me. See, Jesus touched the leper. And it changed him. Not just with the leprosy gone, but his sins were gone. His life was different. Rabbis said that it was difficult to heal the leper, just as difficult as it was to raise the dead. See, both are impossible with man, but neither are a problem for Jesus. He cleanses the defiled. He raises the dead just with a simple touch. He truly touches lives and makes them whole. He did that for me. Has he done that for you? He was moved with compassion when he saw the leper. It was from his inside that motivated him to love. And this was not a pretty sight. He touched the leper before he was cleansed. He was still disfigured, his rags still bloody and soaked with pus. The man was thoroughly unclean Yet Jesus touched him. Far from being repulsed, Jesus reached out. God's repulsed by all of our sin, but he reaches out and touches us. His response is moving. I am willing. Be clean. See, this is the model of ministry for the church. to touch those who are afflicted with mental, physical, emotional, spiritual issues. He never tells the sinner that they are sinners. He never tells the, young, the people that are filled with demons that they are demon-possessed. He simply touches them as a sign of acceptance. He treats them and loves them. He did things that were impossible. He did that for me. Has he did, done that for you? Are you willing to be used of him to touch someone else? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for working in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would use us because you have touched us. You've made us whole. And for those, Lord, who have not been made whole, may you touch us. And Lord, may we be able to touch those around us with concern and love that they need to connect with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.